Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the Dibble Institute's October 2018 webinar, Self-Regulation Skills to Support Healthy Relationships for Youth. I'm Kay Reed and really pleased to welcome you all here today. Um, uh, first, a few housekeeping items. And that is, uh, if you can't hear the audio through your computer, and sometimes this happens, just use this phone, jot this phone number down and the access code, and you can come right back. Um, we will be answering your questions uh, at the end of this session, so please type things that you want to know about in the questions box. Uh, we have poll questions today, um, and I'm going to ask a couple of raise your hand questions. So uh, please participate. It's always more fun that way. And in a few days, typically by the end of the week or early the following week, we will have the webinar archived on our website, uh, and you'll be able to then share it with your colleagues and re-listen to it yourself. So uh, we hope you do that. So first, let me ask everybody a question. Get ready with that little button. How many of you are new to a Dibble webinar? This is your first Dibble webinar. Can I see a show of hands, please? Okay, so most of you are old, sorry the pun, old hands at <laughs> Dibble <to the laughs> webinars. So, uh, so, we'll go, that's, uh, so we'll go through this pretty quickly. But first, uh, say hello to Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Hi, it's good to be here this afternoon. Kathy is our amazing engineer, so thank you, Kathy. And uh, we also have uh, Desiree, <clears throat> Desiree uh, Murray with us. Hi, Desiree. Hi. And we'll introduce Desiree in just a minute. So a little bit real quickly about Dibble, since most of you are, are, are familiar with us, but for those of you who aren't, I'll go over this information really quickly. Uh, we get the funny name, and people always ask me, uh, from the Dibbles. That's Helen and Charlie Dibble. Uh, he was a, uh, an engineer who turned youth worker in his retirement. He saw uh, lots of young people's lives impacted either because of their parents' relationships or their own relationships around romantic relationships. So he, uh, as kind of those fix-it engineer types are, uh, said, you know, let me work on that and did research in the mid-80s about what made for long-lasting, healthy, happy, intimate relationships. But what he, and he found lots of good information, but he, what he didn't find was how people were communicating that with young people, adolescents, young adults. So he, so Charlie started the Dibble Institute. Um, and Kathy, I think that's the next slide. Uh, and today we uh, have reached millions of young people, 1.6 million on our last count over the last 10 years uh, with one of our programs. And I'm using that we in the royal we sense because Dibble does not do direct services. We includes all of you and others who use our materials and reach out to young people. So we reach a lot of young people. And what's even more uh, exciting and important for us is that these young these programs change lives. We know they reduce pregnancy. We know they reduce violence. Um, we know that they help improve communications with parents. And so we see our programs used in all kinds of settings: mental health, um, child welfare, uh, juvenile justice, schools. Just you know where you find young people, uh, it's, it's always a good place for relationship skills education. Uh, is my my take. So a little bit about our values. Uh, Charlie set us on a course of valuing research. So what we do is we translate research into teaching tools uh, that then we make available to people like you uh, to teach. We are a nonprofit organization, and we this is, uh, powers our economic engine is to sell these materials and provide training as well. So this means that from not, not frequently, but there are times where new data comes in, new research comes in, and we do change our, uh, our materials to reflect what we know that is new. So sometimes people say, who's really behind this? Well, who really is behind this are the research scientists um, who are helping, who are out there every day doing evaluations and helping us learn. 
uh, more about uh, these intimate romantic relationships. Uh, the second thing we believe in is uh, we're, we're big fans of stable, healthy families. And this one, you know, you can't tell if it's two parents and two daughters, one older, one younger, or two parents and a daughter and her child. But what's most important to us um, is, is not necessarily the specific family form, but the fact that it's stable, healthy, and safe. So uh, this means that you know, we, we mean no disrespect of single parents. We know that every day they're doing uh, heroic work with keeping their families stable, healthy, and safe. And they deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, we also recognize that, that in families where there is high conflict or abuse of self or others or substances, those are not stable, healthy, and safe. And they should be replaced or, or changed into something that is. So <clears throat> that's our, our message. And we know that lots of young people aspire, you know, most young people aspire to safe, healthy, and stable families. And there's a variety of ways of getting those, including marriage. Uh, and now that everyone can get married, uh, it brings gives the, gives more people that option. But we don't preclude other family forms, to be sure. And lastly, uh, speaking of that, uh, we believe that all people deserve to be treated with respect, and all relationships can be made better with relationship skills. And how we translate that into our work is we make sure that um, our language is inclusive, that um, that we make scenarios that. We actually have some programs with specific scenarios for gay and lesbian youth because they have unique and important challenges uh, that are uh, different than heterosexual challenges. So uh, we, we work to include those and we're pleased to say that our programs are used in many programs with GLBTQ youth and seem to be uh, working really well with them. So uh, we, we, we want to wrap our, our arms around all, all young people. So finally, let me introduce Desiree. So Desiree, I met Desiree uh, at a self-regulation workshop or a, a study group that I was part of, and I was really impressed uh, with the work she was doing. Uh, she is a senior research scientist at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute and research associate professor in the School of Education at UNC in Chapel Hill. Uh, she's a prevention scientist and licensed clinical psychologist who researches self-regulation development and evaluates social and emotional interventions for children and youth. Uh, she trains teachers and mental health professionals in evidence-based interventions uh, and implementation of programs in schools to support their students' self-regulation. Uh, she has led a series of reports uh, to inform self-regulation programs and practices for administration for children and families. And you can see those reports, we've uploaded them onto this webinar, so you can download them easily for yourself. And, uh, you know, if you thought that was enough, uh, she's actually brought in, uh, is quite successful as a, a grant writer, uh, getting over $8 million in funding for her work from ACF, uh, Institute for Educational Sciences, and National Institute for Mental Health. So we're really thrilled to have her here today because there we, when Desiree and I were talking about it, it's like having a Venn diagram where you have two circles and there's an overlap. And there is an overlap between relationship skills, education, and relationship skills that are to be successful in life and self-regulation skills. So it's a nice synergy there. And I'm really pleased to have Desiree here to talk to us about that today. Desiree? Thanks, Kay, and thanks for um, having me here today. Um, it is really um, a fun opportunity for me to uh, get to, to talk to different audiences like, like yours and um, really to kind of be part of um, the work that ACF has really embraced in terms of thinking about where does self-regulation really, really fit into um, relationship education programs. And Muted. It's, it's been fun for me to have conversations with, with you and others on that topic. And um, I hope to uh, have a little bit of time on the end for hearing feedback from you all as, as you think about, um, again, the Venn diagram that you mentioned. 
Um, so before I jump right in, I do want to just acknowledge my colleagues in this work that um, was uh, initially funded by the Administration for Children and Families and was done um, in partnership with my colleagues, Katie Rosenbaum and Christina Christopoulos at Duke Center for Child and Family Policy, where I was um, for a few years before I came to UNC. Um, and as uh, Kay mentioned, um, there are some um, snapshot uh, summary um, of, um, in particular, adolescents and, and young adults, some of the self-regulation intervention um, work that we have done, um, but there are a whole series of reports and briefs that are um, located at this website as well. And in fact, that's actually a first poll question that uh, I um, asked Kathy to, to submit to you all just to get a sense of um, how many of you actually have taken a look at any of those. So could we have the poll, Kathy? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. That's helpful for me. Um, you will get a sense of what some of the information is in those reports. And uh, to the extent that this seems useful and relevant to you, um, uh, you will have some resources that you can follow up with and check out later. Um, okay, next slide, please. So for today, what I wanted to do um, in the next 40 minutes or so is to um, go through um, a set of seven principles that um, our team developed to kind of tell the story of self-regulation, really self-regulation across development. And I'm going to, um, for, for you all today, really hone in on adolescence and, and young adulthood. Um, Self-regulation is something that's gotten a lot of media attention, a lot of attention by, by funders and other organizations, and we have a, a good, good crowd on the call today. So I, I take it many of you um, have, have heard about self-regulation in, in some form, and um, there's a lot of different definitions, a lot of different ways of looking at it, and there can be some confusion around it, and sometimes it sounds very technical. And so part of what we've done is to try and tell us the story of self-regulation development in a way that we think um, really applies to programs um, and practices and policy. Um, and so that's what I'm going to share with you um, at the beginning of the talk. Um, and then I'm going to hone in a little bit more on emotion regulation and decision making as kind of some core aspects of self-regulation skills um, that I think really kind of um, makes a connection with um, healthy relationships, communication skills, and, and problem solving. Um, so I'll do that within the context of um, what we know about self-regulation interventions um, and then a little bit about some other interventions that may be relevant. And then from that, to try and leave you all um, at the end of our time today with a few of my suggestions for, for strategies based upon that. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is the first of the seven principles, and this is just to say that we know from a great deal of research in the last 15 years that self-regulation has really become recognized as foundational to well-being. And when I say well-being, um, that really means much more than, than mental health, which might come to mind, um, but really um, a lot of research um, connecting self-regulation to educational success. In fact, it predicts academic outcomes um, better than IQ does. Um, it predicts economic outcomes, such as the amount of savings that one has, the likelihood of owning a home, um, career status, um, even um, physical health indicators like heart disease and obesity. So um, really think from a broad, even public health perspective, this is, it actually is something to pay attention to and think about how this connects with your programs and your practices and are there aspects of self-regulation that might be valuable to incorporate. All right, next slide. The second principle is just to say, what is the definition um, to provide some of what we think are the 
key core concepts of self-regulation. So this is this is a definition we came up with, and this is um, similar to much of the literature on self-regulation um, in in a few ways. One is that there are aspects of both um, thoughts or cognition as well as emotion and feelings, and that um, both of those things are important. Um, and in fact, we often think of the integration of cognition and emotion as really the heart of self-regulation. I'll come back to that point because it's very relevant to think about um, decision-making actually. Um, and both of those, both cognition and emotion are um, utilized in service of some kind of goal-directed action. So that might be um, a task or an objective that someone is pursuing. Um, it might also have to do with impulse control. In fact, that often is one of the first things that comes to mind when I ask folks what they think about self-regulation. They think, well, that's self-control. But the way um, we like to think about it, we prefer to think about it based upon um, our understanding of the literature is that self-regulation is actually um, much broader. So it really includes some aspects of flexibility and adaptability that, that will help an individual solve problems constructively um, and hopefully in a, in a pro-social way. Um, the one aspect that we included in our definition, of, which may be a little bit different, but I think is actually important, is the idea of self-regulation as an action. So there's many other definitions that sort of define it more as a capacity. And capacity, I think, sounds like something that's static, that's something that is maybe biological in nature. Um, and I think um, that uh, self-regulation is, is multifactorial, and I'll show you a depiction of that in a minute. But the idea of self-regulation as an action is very useful when we think about interventions because it implies that these are, in fact, skills that we can reinforce and teach and grow in everyone. And I, I, I do believe that to be true. Next slide. This is just a visual to kind of put what I was saying together in that um, relative to some other words or definitions you may have heard of, I, I actually think that self-regulation is the broader umbrella term. Um, there's a couple of other words that aren't on there that, that some of you may be wondering about, so I will mention those as well. Um, so resilience, self-regulation is definitely related to resilience. Um, I sort of think about resilience as um, somewhat of an outcome of having strong self-regulation skills, um, or and resilience in particular, using those self-regulation skills in the context of stress, I think is how we often think about it. Um, coping, again, the, the coping literature um, is, um, um, it's related, it, it is, it, but coping is often thought of, again, in response to a specific stressor, whereas self-regulation is something that you do certainly in situations when you're faced with stress, but also at many other times, again, in pursuit of, of pro-social goals. Um, all right, next slide. This is uh, what I was referring to a moment ago in terms of um, many different factors that contribute to self-regulation. So certainly biology, temperament, um, genetics are a component of that. That's absolutely true, but there are many other layers. Um, and this, um, these concentric cir circles are also um, not static. So um, what I mean by that, they, they actually interact with each other. So for example, um, we know, and many of you probably know this quite well, that um, our environment actually can, can get under our skin, if you will, if you kind of follow some of the ACES research, and really impact um, uh, individuals on a biological level. So there's some interaction across levels. Um, skills is a very critical part of that. That's um, clearly where we kind of focus our interventions on typically. But motivation is also really important, especially when we're talking about adolescents, um, thinking about motivation both in terms of internal motivation, so in terms of um, goals and values that someone has, but also in terms of external motivation and thinking about things that, that um, 
uh, individuals and programs and mentors and other types of caregivers uh, might be able to, to use. And also thinking about how motivation and skills interact. So you might, have, you might be working with someone who has all the motivation in the world, but if they lack the skills, they're not going to be very successful. And similarly, you might have someone whose skills are in fact pretty good, but if they lack the motivation, um, again, they're not going to be successful. Um, the caregiver support is also um, plays a very important role and, and oftentimes can be part of the, the motivation and can also um, caregivers certainly teach skills. And caregivers, again, I really am using that term very broadly, not just referring to parents. Um, certainly parents, even for adolescents, even for young adults, even if they're not living at home, certainly continue to play a very important role. But so do a number of other types of caregivers and and mentors um, and individuals who are really connecting with youth in a positive and supportive way. Um, and then the environmental context, which as I mentioned, can certainly serve as a source of stress um, and impact self-regulation in a negative way, but simultaneously um, can also be a place where um, supports are provided. All right, next slide. Um, uh, this point is, I'll just make this very briefly, actually, um, I think I referred to it earlier, that um, there actually is a lot of reason and, and, and research to suggest that um, thinking of self-regulation um, um, in some of the ways we think about literacy, it's actually a pretty good metaphor um, in that there's many different components. We don't teach them all at once. There's no one 12-week program that's going to um, accomplish all of our um, instructional goals for self-regulation. Um, that uh, what we teach kids also, we know they learn better in the context of relationships. Um, we also know just like with reading, if there is um, an adolescent or young adult who is still struggling, it does not mean that person can never learn to read. Um, there are, are always opportunities. Um, uh, understanding that, of course, some youth are going to need more um, specialized instruction or more types of supports than others. All right, next slide. Um, and we'll spend more time on this later when I talk about strategies, but I wanted to at least introduce this idea of co-regulation that some of you may be familiar with. This is um, a term used more often in the early childhood literature, um, but really fits in, in many ways is very appropriate to um, the important process that we think about that caregivers provide that we call co-regulation. So co-regulation has to do with an interaction where, again, it's in the context of a um, warm, nurturing, safe and secure relationship. Um, as Kay was mentioning, that safe and secure is really is really foundational um, for any type of learning. And, and really, I would say for learning those emotion regulation skills um, in particular, um, as well as uh, executive functioning, um, cognitive regulation. Um, those relationships are where we can both teach self-regulation skills, teach those in formal ways through formal programs, but also teach those in um, through our moment-to-moment -moment interactions um, with our modeling and even what we call coaching. And I'll come back to this point a little bit later. Um, and then another key piece of that, which may be um, relevant to some of you in your um, agencies and organizations is um, structuring the environment in a way that can make self-regulation manageable. Next slide. The sixth principle is that self-regulation develops over an extended period of time. Um, that might be obvious, but what was maybe a little bit less obvious until um, new research emerged in the last 10 years is that there actually are two pretty critical time periods. Um, Kathy, if you could click the slide, I think I have some circles that come in here. Yep, and one more. Yeah, great. So there, we actually um, uh, thought that early childhood was really the only point that, the only really critical point where um, there were tremendous uh, neurobiological changes um, in parts of the brain in particular that are related to self-regulation. Um, and we've been able to see with um, uh, fMRI scans and other new technologies that in fact early adolescence is another opportunity. Um, and really through adolescence, there is um, tremendous um, developmental growth. And I think um, uh, what I think of as, as opportunity 
opportunities um, for self-regulation development as well. You can see how the how there's just uh, tremendous growth during those periods of time. Um, the other comment I will make about this is that um, if you'll notice, it says full bucket in the top right. So the bucket is another metaphor that we like to use in terms of thinking about um, an individual's uh, ability to utilize um, their self-regulation skills. And um, as I mentioned early, earlier, any individual, individuals vary in terms of how much of um, their own skills they have developed. And that certainly is very dependent upon the caregivers in their lives and across time. Um, so for any individual, um, de depending on where their own, where the youth's own self-regulation skills are, we would hope that caregivers can, can sort of fill the bucket, if you will, in terms of providing additional supports and structures so that that youth will be able to function um, at a level where they're able to be successful in relationships and lots of other aspects of their lives. To the extent that that doesn't happen, then there may be more struggles. But this is also implying that there are, are again, multiple opportunities for intervention. All right, and the last principle. Um, this is to really pay attention to um, how stress and adversity impact self-regulation development. In fact, one of the reports that we prepared, the entire report, is all about, um, it's a literature review on how stress um, impacts self-regulation development. Um, we know that stress can serve some good purposes. It's an opportunity to learn problem solving and build coping skills. Um, but many of you are also familiar with this idea of toxic stress. Um, and um, this is something certainly that can come from ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. And again, we actually know now that that really can affect some of the um, brain wiring, particularly in exactly those areas um, that self-regulation is dependent on. And and one of the things that happens is to the extent to which an individual experiences kind of this chronic or really severe level of stress, it actually makes them more vulnerable to future stressors so that um, a very small sort of event or stress could actually um, uh, be experienced in a, in a much more um, debilitating way if the level of stress experienced has been kind of chronically elevated. So actually, I think this is where my next poll question comes, Kathy. So be helpful for me to know how many of you all um, uh, work with youth who you believe or, or know um, experience toxic stress. Again, toxic being um, chronic or severe um, levels of stress that are exceeding the youth's ability to cope with that. Wow, okay. <laughs> that was going to be my guess, although maybe not 97%. So that's impressive. So that's actually really helpful. So the next slide is actually for me to talk a little bit more um, about stress, and I will keep that into consideration uh, as I go through the rest of the slides as well. So I imagine that you all know very, very well how stress can make self-regulation harder. So um, I gave you a little bit of context a minute ago, but um, we really know that um, uh, under stress, the brain really um, overreacts to normal stressors, as I was as I was saying. So, so our stress hormones, if you will, um, uh, ideally after the stressor is over, kind of should go back to a baseline state. But under toxic stress or under some of the conditions of adversity that many of your clients um, may be living in, that never happens. Um, and so um, physically, emotionally, and cognitively, um, that individual is really sort of operating at a chronically high stress level. And certainly that is having some of these um, physical impacts in terms of negatively impacting physical health, but really also impacting exactly the kinds of things that we think about in terms of self-regulation. So 
part of what it does is it actually makes it harder to control impulses and delay gratification. So um, one of the ways of thinking about that, one of the metaphors sometimes used for self-regulation is um, thinking about self-regulation as a muscle. And if you're constantly using that muscle um, to deal with stressors, it doesn't leave a lot left over for paying attention, planning, making decisions, flexible thinking, solving problems. Again, all those things that, that you all may in fact be, be working with some of your clients on in the context of, of relationship education. The other thing that it does is it, it certainly impacts mood. Um, it can in, impact um, sensitivity, anger sensitivity. It impacts perceptions of other people's intent. Um, and then, of course, you might see sort of overreactions or dysregulation or even um, sort of on the other extreme, really sort of shutting down emotionally. And again, to, I'm sure that you all can anticipate some of the things I'm going to say late, later in terms of how that may, might um, be played out in terms of um, relationships. All right, next slide. So let's just think for a few minutes about um, kind of um, adolescence in particular. Um, so next slide. So I think I um, I'm, I referred to this um, pretty picture of, of brains, which is really um, just uh, reviewing the point that I made um, earlier, which is that, in fact, um, it's not until um, early adolescence and then through adolescence um, that um, really actually through until well into the 20s, actually, that brain wiring isn't structurally mature. Um, the purple indicates structurally mature. That's the basic key to that. Um, but um, Part of what that means is that um, during the age period when I imagine most of you are working with youth, um, ages 15 to 25 is the, the age group we focused on in our research that I'm going to be referring to today, is there is a lot of brain connections that are, are still in process. Um, and so what that means is that, again, there are both opportunities to impact that brain architecture that, again, will be lifelong. Um, so it means that when good habits, like good habits with exercise or relaxation or even self-regulation skills, when those things are, habit, are established during that time period, they're really going to be embedded in a pretty lifelong way. Um, the flip side of that is um, the risks of this age, which I imagine you all know as well. So we also know that, for example, substance use during this age can have some particularly toxic, toxic effects, which are equally lasting. All right, next slide. So I wanted to just um, highlight a couple of um, key components of emotion regulation for adolescents. And um, some of these are just fun studies that people do in laboratories. But again, I think you can, that are very consistent with, with other things we know. So I just pulled out a few key points because I thought they actually were, were quite relevant to thinking about relationships. Um, so the first is that, and this is a very, very current study, um, is that um, this is actually interesting because it's compared to younger kids, so compared to children and compared to adults, adolescents have more difficulty telling apart emotions that might be occurring at the same time. Now, kids actually are, are not good at identifying two feelings simultaneously. They just say it's one feeling. Um, adolescents, um, as they as the brain develops and adolescents and cognitive capacity increases, part of what happens is that they might have a sense that there's more than one emotion. And I like this picture in particular because when I look at this young woman, it's kind of hard to say, is she really angry? Is she really sad? Um, is it both? Is it something else? Um, and this is, in fact, these are the questions that both um, for themselves and maybe even this young woman right now in the picture, 
that is a very difficult discrimination to make, um, identifying or differentiating co-occurring emotions. And you can think about sort of in the context of relationships, how critical that is and how complex those emotions can get. Um, this, is, this is something actually that probably is going to make um, some of those, some, certainly some communications um, a lot harder. Next slide. Um, this is um, another one of those laboratory studies, but um, again, I think sometimes they they are um, are useful because um, they I can absolutely see application to um, to day to day interactions. Um, so this little study again looked at. Um, uh, children and adults compared to adolescents. And um, if you look at the black line that's higher for teens, what that actually means is that they're making more errors um, in pressing a button when they see a positive face after being told not to do that. <laughs> so this means that they're actually having trouble inhibiting an emotional response um, when they see something positive. So um, what the implications for that may be is, is actually, this is the impulse control, right? So this is in particular, if it's something that's desirable or something exciting or something that has a lot of potentially positive emotions around it, um, it's gonna be hard to stop. Um, so I thought that might be um, relevant for you all to think about. And I have one more I wanted to mention, and this was not done in the lab, but this was kind of nice because it followed kids from um, middle school through high school. So over a four year period and um, over that time period, um, uh, well, at the beginning of that time period um, was when um, adolescents were having the most trouble in terms of emotions being negative, really um, variable, so very unstable emotions, and really extremes in emotions. And I'm sure this sounds very familiar to you. So this, this increase towards stability, so the imp this improvement in emotional stability happens during high school. So this is sort of interesting to think about developmentally in terms of the age of youth that you work with. Um, as you all, I'm sure know, there is a huge difference between the beginning and end of high school in terms of emotion regulation. And this probably gets played out um, in relationship in lots of ways um, as well. Um, one comment I will make um, is, because I'm, I'm kind of talking in general rules, rules of developmental um, guidelines, if you will, if you're working with kids who have been chronically stressed and really have delayed self-regulation in other ways, you actually might expect that um, their emotion regulation development um, may in fact be delayed too. So you may be working with young adults who are still very much having trouble in a way that we might think, you know, gosh, this looks like an early high schooler, but this, this young person is in their early 20s, and maybe that's just where they are developmentally. And so sometimes actually it can be helpful in your head to think about, gosh, given where, where this, this youth has been and um, where they may continue to be living in adversity, it totally makes sense um, that kind of um, their emotion regulation is, um, is a few years behind where we might think it would be otherwise. That might be helpful and useful in terms of um, approaches that you're thinking about as well. Um, but again, the other thing that I think about in terms of the opportunity piece is I think that um, it means that um, uh, this is actually a prime time to think about interventions that, that help kids um, build these skills, especially kids whose skills are, are delayed. Next slide. So I actually think I've made I've made um, my key point on here, which is um, that uh, the adolescence is a time of both vulnerability and opportunity. Um, we really think that self-regulation is is out of out of balance in terms of what we know from brain research. The parts of the brain which are involved in sort of emotion processing are are pretty sensitive and pretty active. Um, we actually um, can see that adolescents in some ways are 
seem to be more sensitive to stress than adults and, um, and younger kids are. And at the same time, even though they have these um, newly developed cognit cognitive abilities, they're really still under development and relative to sort of the amygdala versus the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala is, is um, more highly developed and, and probably going to be more powerful um, in, in many situations. Um, and of course, um, the influence of peers, which we know um, developmentally, again, some really interesting research looking at, um, it's actually fascinating that peer influence actually happens in lab animals. Um, adolescent, adolescent mice actually respond to this, um, we know, for example, that um, simply telling an adolescent that um, another another teen is watching them on video or is watching their driving will increase their their taking risks. Um, and so it's a very powerful influence. It really impacts how um, how how an adolescent views and evaluates risks if they have peers around them. And again, you all probably know this because you, um, you work with youth. All right, next slide. So this is a long set of skills. I'm not going to read. These are kind of captured on the snapshots that I believe are up on the web website. But what I want to point out is that um, as I referred to earlier, um, many of these skills we might think of as sort of more cognitively focused um, on the left side. Um, and on the right side, um, uh, some of these are more focused on emotion regulation. Um, and then the last two in particular are ones that I think of really are good examples of highlighting the, in, the integration of emotion regulation and cognitive regulation, which is pretty sophisticated in terms of self-regulation development. Um, something I think is probably, um, I'm going to come back to these two because I think these are very much um, uh, relevant for thinking about relationships. Um, and, and they do, in fact, require some pretty sophisticated self-regulation skills. All right, next slide. All right, so here are um, a couple of, well, three of the skills that I thought um, would make sense to think about a little bit more um, in terms of emotion regulation and decision making in the context of healthy relationships. So staying calm and keeping perspective so you can address conflict and solve problems in relationships is certainly related to some of those communication skills that many of you teach. Um, very much related to making decisions that reflect your values, goals, and hopefully also reflecting concern for others. So you can think about how this might impact decisions related to choosing partners, um, beginning relationships, ending relationships, sexual decision making, um, and also certainly decision making in the context of strong emotions and sensation seeking. So my question for you before I um, make some comments about these three areas is um, our next poll. And I will reread these because I know these were long. So my, the question here is, which one of these skills um, for healthy relationships um, do the youth you work with struggle the most? And there is an all of the above um, option. A says staying calm and keeping perspective in addressing conflict and solving problems. B is making decisions that reflect personal values, future goals, and concern for others. And C is effective decision making in the context of strong emotions and sensation seeking. All right, that is um, that is interesting. A little bit of a spread. Um, I thought many of you may say all of the above. Um, so the making decisions that reflect personal values may be a little bit um, less um, of a struggle, perhaps. Maybe maybe perhaps not irrelevant, but less of a struggle than um, what I would think about are are A and C in particular related to. Um, the, some of those emotion regulation aspects. Although again, the majority of you felt like all three of them were relevant. Okay, next slide. So let's think about, uh, yeah, this one. Let's think about um, just emotions in the context of relationships a little bit more. So um, we know that that um, 
emotions are um, absolutely um, critical in intimate relationships. This is probably where, you know, we all of us, not speaking to adolescents in particular, experience some of our most intense um, emotions, really, really positive, can also be really, really negative feelings. Um, but it's also the place where we sometimes um, bring emotions from other parts of our lives are brought into relationships. So we can bring our stress from school or work into those relationships um, as well. So if you think about that, and you might even, you know, kind of reflect upon emotion in, you know, any of your own individual intimate relationships and, and imagine then that in the context of what we've been saying about adolescents who we know are um, have some hard wiring to be sensitive to any kind of social cues and rewards. Um, we know that they experience emotions more intensely. There's more ups and downs. They're not particularly good at differentiating, com differentiating complex emotions. They're not good at suppressing emotional responses. And you can pretty quickly imagine just how complicated and challenging managing emotion in relationships um, can be for adolescents. And this is adolescence in general. And so again, to kind of add that layer, 97% um, of you are working with adolescents that are really kind of living in some kind of toxic stress situation or dealing with that on an ongoing basis. And that is just adding one additional layer that is adding um, um, challenges to all of this as well. Next slide. So just to tease this apart a little bit, um, when when I think of emotion regulation, um, and I think the literature would sort of think about this in, in a similar way, there's this aspect of emotional awareness, um, which includes this making sense of your emotions, is like we were talking about earlier, being able to articulate those feelings, to say what you're feeling, um, really is pretty important for being able to communicate what you want and what you need in a relationship. So absolutely critical in terms of some of those communication skills. Um, and then there's this other aspect to emotion regulation, which has to do with actually regulating the emotion. Um, and so I think there's a couple of pieces to that. One is being able to sort of, it's really sort of about accept and tolerate emotions. Um, and, and so the alternative to that is um, doing things to suppress emotions, um, to maybe distract yourself from emotions, or um, acting out on those emotions, um, or, or perhaps even over controlling um, those emotions. So um, part of what we, um, uh, what actually um, a lot of interventions and maybe some programs that you all work with, I imagine do this as well, is thinking about um, skills and strategies for youth to actually help them, help them tolerate some of that emotional distress, which inevitably is going to occur. And to the extent that they can build their skills, um, that is really going to help them um, listen, listen without judging, see another person's perspective. And then of course, that makes solving problems for mutual benefits so much easier. Um, at the same time, what I would say is that if all we have um, are communication skills and we ignore the emotion, um, you know, we can teach kids all day long that they need to use I statements, that they need to how to restate what the other person just said. But if we aren't addressing this other piece, um, I think that it's going to get, um, uh, I think we're going to um, uh, not be terribly helpful um, when when that kid um, or or anyone is is in a situation with any kind of emotion whatsoever. All right, next slide. Um, again, thinking about um, how strong emotions function in decision making, particularly um, sexual and relationship decision making. One of the things um, that happens because adolescents sort of brains are still, some of these connections are still um, being built and be being developed. Part of what can happen is that there can be a really strong emotion um, that is experienced and that is um, then reacted and acted upon without 
um, without stimulating any of the rational areas of the brain. So it probably makes sense to some of you um, who uh, have, uh, are probably not unfamiliar with a youth saying, well, you know, I, I knew exactly what the consequences were. And yes, I did know what was happening, what would happen if I did this, and I did it anyway. No, I can't explain it very well. Well, this is part of what that expl explanation might be. Um, I mean, strong emotion really dis disrupts information processing, and it, um, it uh, impacts um, weighing pros and cons in a more rational way that in fact adolescents are really building their ability to do that rationally, but it not so much yet in the context of emotion. So this is where you really see a gap between intention and behavior. Um, the, other, the other piece that gets brought in that impacts decisions uh, and maybe leads to more impulsive decisions is sort of this other developmental aspect of sort of reward seeking and um, seeking novelty. So that um, that's certainly probably part of some of driving towards um, sensual experiences and maybe impacting sexual decision making as well. And then the other thing, of course, is that um, uh, decision making, one of the things that helps um, helps us as we get older make good decisions is we've had a lot of relational emotional learning in our lives before and so we use that and we can refer to that and adolescents of course don't have that um, and so um, uh, if you think about all of those things it probably makes sense as to why um, some poor decisions or regretted decisions are made um, all right next slide and I think in the interest of time, I am going to um, actually, can you just skip to a couple more? I'm just going to hit the bottom line here in terms of one more slide in terms of um, when we review the self-regulation intervention research. Um, uh, there were about 60 studies that we looked at for high schoolers and young adults. And so the positive news here is that um, there are actually overall a lot of positive and meaningful changes, um, particularly in terms of cognitive regulation, in terms of mental health. Um, However, the, there were also a lot of limitations. So there was a lot of variability in terms of the effects of programs. If you are interested in what we found for specific programs, I would encourage you to look at the appendix to report three that we prepared on the ACF website, because that's where you can find each of those studies. And we actually show what the effect size were for emotion regulation, cognitive regulation, and different outcomes, and including interpersonal outcomes, which which are most um, relevant for thinking about relationships. I will say, however, that some of the limitations of the research is um, that um, there are not a lot of studies that um, with older youth that have actually looked at healthy relationships as an outcome. So we absolutely need more research to be done in this area. Um, and also, um, there's some limitations on impact for emotion regulation. Um, and part of why I think that is, is because a lot of the programs we tend to do with adolescents tend to be very cognitive. And I think sometimes don't overlook, uh, I, I think they overlook and don't pay enough attention to um, the emotion regulation piece we've been talking about today. All right, next slide. Um, and I'm going to skip this one too. And um, just kind of dive into the last section here, which is about strategies. Um, so I do want to say, however, my caveat for this is sort of these are some of my recommendations, which are based upon um, generally what I know about self-regulation interventions. I know that literature pretty well, but be, there's not a tremendous amount available um, speaking to relationships. So part of what I'm going to say is sort of based upon theory. And this is sort of the theory, um, this idea of co-regulation that I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, which is sort of um, a, um, a roadmap of what, well, what can I do? What can our program do? Um, the relationships are really core and really key. Um, that's something that I think sometimes programs um, uh, might, might want to think a little bit more about how they support um, relationships with the youth that they work with and how, how do they validate and accept 
um, build um, respectful relationships with someone that can be um, lasting relationships um, as well. Um, so that's sort of foundational. Um, and then um, some of the self-regulation skills that we have been talking about, um, we like to think of this idea of coaching, um, which is really um, the word coaching is intentional because it's um, how a coach might teach sports skills. So it's really has to do with sort of prompting those skills in um, maybe role-playing those skills, um, maybe noticing situations where they might be applied. Um, asking the youth some open-ended questions to help them reflect um, because we know with adolescents that uh, the more you tell them exactly what to do, um, the less they want to do exactly that thing, um, which is developmentally, you know, where they should be. So that's the idea of coaching some of these skills. And as I said, some of that could be some more formal coaching and teaching, and some of that actually could simply be in the moment and, and conversations that occur. Um, and then the last piece is really structuring the environment. Um, so these are some things that um, I've talked about the skills, but I also think that there's an important piece to think about, especially working with youth living um, in, in a lot of stress, is are there things that can be done to reduce the stress and to reduce some of the demands on the self-regulation skills? And given some of the challenges, how hard it is for youth, um, uh, with self-regulation in some of these situations, and um, are there things that, that um, caregivers can do to just decrease those risks in general? Um, so next slide. Um, so here's just a couple of my suggestions for things um, that some other programs um, uh, have have thought about. Mindfulness programs. Do we need to do we need to go ahead and stop to have a few seconds of a few moments of, of questions? Yeah, we do. Do you want to just okay. go to your the take home points maybe and then? Yeah, <clears throat> let me do that. Let me do that because I certainly have given the big picture here. All right, Kathy, so, Kathy, could you, you go to fourth, 41, slide 41? Yeah, so uh, my, my take home points here is that um, uh, hopefully hopefully the conversation today um, might be um, useful for you in thinking about self-regulation as a lens for understanding adolescent relationships. Um, thinking about this idea of teaching self-regulation skills in those day-to-day -day interactions. Think about prioritizing relationships structuring the environment. For young adults, I would actually think about some collaborative um, approaches in terms of helping that youth identify and create their own supportive environments, um, places and people that are gonna help support their well-being. Um, and then um, some of that, that coaching idea in particular with attention around the emotion regulation. So I will stop there. We're almost at our time. Sorry for running a little bit long. No worries. Lots of good information there. So I have two questions here and your other people are welcome to write in. But one question, um, this was early on, do you, how do you think divorce, involvement with drugs, crime, incarceration impacts youth and their self-regulation? And this, uh, this writer, uh, Karen, mm -hmm. says she thinks it's 100%, but what do you think? <laughs> So those are all stressors, um, absolutely. And I mean, we know in terms of, um, I, I think I think sort of that was a pretty good checklist of the ACEs um, in many ways. Um, we know that the more of those types of adversities and individual experiences, the more they're gonna struggle with self-regulation. I think the one piece I would add to that um, is that, um, how it affects an individual. First off, there's tremendous individual variability. So there are things that the individual brings that helps them cope. And then there's this whole other aspect of what are the supports in that youth environment that have been present to help them cope with those experiences? And I'm sure you can imagine there's a whole range of how well families support their kids through divorces. Um, so the fact of a divorce, yes, it's a risk factor, but does it become toxic stress? That's a really critical question here. And where it becomes toxic is when the stress exceeds the coping abilities that that individual child has in combination with the supports that are provided to them by caregivers in their environment. 
So uh, Galen asks, is there information on self-regulation skills that be can be taught in more detail? Where can we get more information on coaching? Is there a curriculum available? Ah, <laughs> um, excellent question. So um, certainly um, I've referred you to the ACF website for more information on, on my research. That is not a curriculum, however. Um, there are um, part of what, um, well, one of the things I want to refer to, and then Kay, you might want to jump in here as well, is sure. that um, ACF, ACF is very interested in um, programs thinking about um, incorporating self-regulation skills. Um, what I would say is that there are actually probably many, many ways in which programs already have aspects in which you are doing some pieces of this. So part of the first thing I would say is actually looking at your existing curriculum to see where the overlap and connections are. And, um, you know, you could, for example, take that list of self-regulation skills and sort of go through your curriculum and say, are we addressing this? Are we addressing that? In fact, there's actually some currently funded work that is piloting that and is sort of piloting um, some training for individuals. Um, you know, hopefully that's something that is um, translated into a curriculum at some point. Um, I think I'll, um, Kay, would you like to add to that? Yeah, and I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you. For those of us who have written and we haven't responded, <clears throat> we will get back to you with your questions. Um, uh, if you would like a participant cert uh, certificate for today, uh, please email uh, Kathy and we'll show you that email at the end of this. But to your point, um, Yes, we're part of a larger study. We believe that relationship skills programming is, autom you know, really addresses a lot of these self-regulation skills. And the research that Desiree pointed out is using Relationship Smarts Plus as the basis of that. Mm -hmm. We also have Mind Matters, which includes lots of the think differentiating thinking from feeling and using mindfulness techniques and things to self-regulate. But anyway, we have to hang off here. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. As I said, we will put the webinar, the slides, and Desiree's excellent handouts uh, through uh, on our website uh, for you to um, to look for. Also, Kathy at DibbleInstitute.org will get you a certificate. Keep in touch in all the normal ways. And next month, uh, we're going to have a really great one: uh, love notes and sexual abuse prevention. We're going to have some uh, of people on who are using love notes uh, to meet the requirements of Aaron's law in their state. And so uh, we're, we're very excited about that. So thank you, Desiree, for being on this broadcast. Thanks everyone for, for being here and we'll see you next month. Thank you.